Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Donna McInerney and I'm the CEO of the Foundation for Educational Administration. And as many of you know, FEA is a nonprofit foundation created by the New Jersey Principals and Supervisors Association all the way back in 1985 with the, the sole mission of supporting New Jersey's educators through high quality professional learning. And we do that on a wide variety of topics, including uh, leadership, legal education, and best practices. Over the last several years, in fact, over the last five years, educators from more than 500 New Jersey school districts have participated in FEA professional learning, including Legal One. And we've done it on a variety of platforms, face-to-face, -face, in the districts, virtual, uh, coaching, uh, asynchronous um, online courses. Um, and so that has been our primary goal. But we also offer as much support to the districts and our members as we can. And today is a great opportunity for us to do that with our colleagues from both in-house and from the, from the districts. As we come to the end of a very tumultuous school year, I am very excited that so many of you are able to join us this afternoon to focus on the recent passage of this legislation connected to diversity and inclusion instruction. Now more than ever, this work is more important and we know that before the pandemic, we were all well aware of the inequities in our schools, but the pandemic has clearly provided a powerful spotlight on this challenge. Implementation of the new curriculum requirements, however, is not happening in a vacuum. Uh, earlier this week, Education Week reported that there was legislation proposed in 21 states to limit how teachers could teach about racism and sexism. So we know that in light of this context, it was critically important that educators come together to discuss issues around implementation, communication, and challenges. So before we get started, I wanna thank my colleagues from NJPSA and FEA joining me today. Dave Nash, Director of Legal One. Real pleasure Jenny, to be here. <laughs> Jenny Lamon, Assistant Director of Government Relations with NJPSA. Peg McDonald, Coordinator of Special Projects and Fidelia Sturdivant, Coordinator of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at NJPSA. I also want to extend a warm welcome and express my very deep gratitude to our colleagues from the field who are joining us today. Uh, these colleagues have been doing this work for a few years now and bring some rich voices uh, to, the, to the conversation. From Bridgeton Public Schools, we have Eniola Ajay. She's currently Director of Special Education, and as of July 1st, Assistant Superintendent in Bridgeton Public Schools. We have her colleague, Christopher Taviana, Tavi, I'm sorry, Chris, Christopher Tavani, uh, Director of Research Planning and Evaluation at Bridgeton. From East Orange School District, we have Shay Richardson, Social Studies Supervisor. Uh, from Logan Township Public Schools, we've got Heather Moran, Principal of Logan Middle School. And from South Brunswick, we have Jennifer Disler, Assistant Superintendent, of curriculum instruction and administration. So before I turn the program over to my colleagues, David and Jenny, a few housekeeping items. If you have not already done so, kindly mute your microphones. While we anticipate an opportunity for Q&A towards the end of the program, we do encourage you to post your questions in the chat throughout and our staff will be keeping an eye on that and uh, sharing your questions with our speakers. Um, during, we ask you to turn on speaker view right now. Later on during the presentation, we'll be using Spotlight to feature um, our panel discussion and our district team presentation. So right now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to David. Thanks again to all of you for joining us. Thank you everyone for being with us today. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to talk with all of you um, as we discuss a, a very important new curriculum requirement that uh, school districts are planning to put into place. And we're very excited to be discussing that, but to more broadly be discussing critical issues related to equity and thinking about how we can make sure that this new curriculum requirement is part of a larger comprehensive effort to address equity in all of its aspects. Uh, so we're very excited to uh, be offering this today. Of course, for those of you who have been to a prior Legal One presentation, um, for the first portion of this, I will be walking through some key legal issues 
And as we do that, uh, you probably all uh, realize this, but we're not technically giving legal advice, um, but giving you the best uh, information available on those issues. Uh, we are going to be walking through the, an overview of the new legislation um, and some related curriculum requirements, uh, some foreseeable issues that could arise when it comes to implementing this new curriculum requirement um, and some key legal considerations related to that implementation and some proactive steps that we should think about taking. Uh, we will then have a wonderful opportunity to hear from uh, a number of districts. We will be hearing from the Bridgeton School District about the great work they're doing uh, broadly at addressing issues of equity as part of uh, looking at their comprehensive equity plan. Um, and then you'll hear some great um, discussion uh, from the field, uh, from the districts that you uh, just heard from, and we're going to hear uh, some of the steps that they are taking to turn this requirement into a meaningful curriculum K through 12. Uh, we'll finish up with um, giving you a preview of some resources that are available for all of you um, and suggesting some next steps that you might want to think about as we get ourselves started. Um, at this um, point, I'm happy to turn the program over to Jenny Lamont. Jenny has been doing incredible work for us as part of our government relations team. Um, and our government relations team did a wonderful job when it came to giving the input from the field and from school leaders on this new legislation. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Donna. Thank you to all of you for being here this afternoon. It's my pleasure to join you today and talk a little bit about the legislative process and NJPSA's role in that process and how we got here. A lot of people know that, that the bill became law, but they don't know exactly all, you know, all the ins and outs of how that came to be. Governor Murphy signed A4454 into law on March 1st of this year. It's now chapter 32. And this bill does require school districts to provide instruction on diversity and inclusion in an appropriate place in the curriculum of students in grades kindergarten through 12 as part of the implementation of the New Jersey Student Learning Standards. It's important to note the original version of this bill had required that the instruction be included in the comprehensive health and physical education standards. But NJPSA instead proposed that this instruction be infused within the standards in an appropriate place as districts were already doing. We did not want to see a new curriculum mandate through legislation. The amendments that we were able to obtain do in fact provide that the instruction on diversity and inclusion will instead be infused throughout the curriculum. The statute does apply to grades K through 12 and will highlight and promote economic diversity, concepts of equity, inclusion, and tolerance. The bill, now law, also requires that schools examine the impact that unconscious bias and economic disparities have at both an individual level and on society as a whole. Additionally, the law encourages safe, welcoming and inclusive school environments as is already required by the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights and our school mission and codes of conduct. An important part of our ask during the negotiations of this legislation was for the New Jersey Department of Education to provide guidance to districts. And ultimately the law does, it requires the NJDOE to develop sample learning activities and resources designed to promote diversity and inclusion in our schools. We knew that you would be under tight timelines with the effective date of this bill beginning this fall. And we wanted NJDOE to assist by pooling resources, best practices and sample learning activities to guide the way. Chapter 32 requires it. However, despite several attempts at outreach on this issue prior to today's webinar, NJDOE has not gotten back to us with this information as of yet. We will keep trying, but in the meantime, we plan to address those needs with you today. Next slide, please. It's worth, oh, sorry, you were already there, Dave, one step ahead of me. It's worth noting that the passage of this bill was not without controversy. The Senate passed the bill with only 26 votes in favor and 13 opposing, and the General Assembly passed the bill by a similar slim margin, 46 votes in favor and 29 opposing. There was a lot of parent testimony when this bill was heard in committees in both houses. Opponents of the bill argued that it tramples on the rights of parents and exposes children to these topics at much too young of an age. 
some legislators that were opposed to this bill had actually supported a previous version that required that limited the instruction to grades nine through 12. Supporters of the bill argued that these are issues that students are already talking about and we need to give educators guidance to help them teach children and appreciate the differences among them. And the sponsor of this bill spoke to its legislative intent that in reality, the bottom line at the end of the day, this bill is really just about treating one another well and being kind. I'd like at this point to turn it back over to my colleague, Dave Nash, Director of Legal One, for a deeper dive into the new curriculum requirements and the existing connections that already exist to the student learning standards. Thanks so much, Jenny. And again, uh, thank you um, and Deborah Bradley for the incredible work you did on this legislation. Um, I think it was such a positive message to say that we're going to address these issues throughout the curriculum and not simply focus it on one particular content area. Um, and that was thanks to, to your great work. Um, as we look at this new requirement, it's important to make sure that we understand all of the aspects of this legislation. It's a short bill and you can see the entire legislation uh, right here on your screen. It does require school districts to put in place a K through 12 curriculum. Um, and for many school districts, these issues um, have been addressed in one way or another, certainly at the high school level in many districts at the middle school level and in some districts already at the elementary school level. Uh, but this does create that requirement for all school districts. And it requires us to address issues of uh, economic diversity, equity, inclusion, tolerance, belonging, um, connected to gender and sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, disabilities, and religion. Um, it also requires that we help students understand the unconscious biases that can impact our decisions. And that's a critical concept. Um, each of us has unconscious bias. Each of us has our own implicit biases, and it's critical that we help students to understand and recognize those biases, um, understand the impact that they can have, and even without conscious intent to understand the harm that sometimes can occur through our actions. Uh, so certainly that's an important part of this legislation. Um, the legislation is very specific that we need to make sure we're addressing issues of race and ethnicity, sexual and gender identity, uh, mental and physical disabilities, and religious belief. Um, and as Jenny said, uh, there is a requirement for the Department of Education to provide sample learning activities and resources. This legislation, of course, doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, we have, as many of you know, a large number of curriculum mandates in the state of New Jersey. Uh, one of those requirements requires inclusion uh, of instruction on the political, economic, and social contributions of two groups. One group is individuals with disabilities, and the other is le uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender individuals. Um, and that this be placed in an appropriate place in the curriculum at the middle and high school levels. Uh, so that requirement was passed in 2019. Uh, school districts should have implemented that this past year um, and should be continuing with that going forward. But it is, um, I think, a, an interesting case study for us in what might happen as we're looking to implement this new law. Uh, I think for the vast majority of your students, parents, and staff, they're going to be supportive. Uh, of the important work we need to do in putting this new requirement in place. But we shouldn't be naive enough to think that we won't have any pushback. So here's an example. We had a Board of Education member um, in Hackensack um, who was upset about the requirement that had passed in 2019. That board member uh, sent an email to the superintendent indicating that she was disgusted and appalled by this new requirement that was put into place, um, believing that it was repugnant, um, talking about how an al alternative lifestyle narrative is being shoved down our children's throats. Um, some really disturbing comments. Um, this board member, uh, somehow word got out that the board member had sent this email. Board member probably told uh, somebody, and next thing you know, there is an open public records act request to see the email and it had to be released. 
It was a public document that had to be made available under the Open Public Records Act. I hope that nothing like this happens in any of your districts, but it certainly may happen in some districts as we're looking to implement this new requirement. Um, and we need to be prepared for that. Um, if something like this were to happen and this sort of a comment were to come from an employee of the school district, we have very strong legal precedent that it could be a basis for disciplinary action. And that's because of the significant harm that that sort of a comment could cause for students. Uh, so we're gonna to touch on some important case law that can reinforce how we would have to respond if we have issues like this and those sorts of comments coming as we implement this new requirement. As I said, we have many curriculum requirements in place and a number of those curriculum requirements already in place address various aspects of equity and discrimination. So of course we have requirements to uh, address Holocaust and genocide instruction, um, African-American history, uh, dating violence, sexual assault prevention, the dangers of sexting. There's a Deaf Students Bill of Rights that was recently enacted. We have requirements related to digital citizenship and social media. Uh, and of course we know that unfortunately social media can often be used to spread really uh, inappropriate discriminatory messages uh, from time to time. Um, and as we're implementing this new requirement, you may have some parents saying, I want to opt my child out of this requirement. There is no opt out of this. This is something that is infused throughout our New Jersey learning standards. This is something that districts will need to be infusing in the curriculum. So there is no option for parents to say that I don't want my child to learn about any portion of this new requirement. And that's an important piece that we have to recognize up front. There are some other narrow exceptions in the health curriculum uh, where sometimes a parent can opt out, but that does not apply to this new requirement. Of course, as we are addressing this new curriculum requirement, um, we need to be prepared because issues related to equity and discrimination could arise. Um, so we have many other state and federal laws that potentially could come into play as we're implementing this requirement. We have New Jersey's Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights. And we're gonna be talking about uh, with this curriculum requirement, some very sensitive issues that certainly um, if mishandled could potentially lead to bullying of students or discrimination against students. Um, and we have a very strong state law against discrimination. Uh, New Jersey also recently enacted the Strengthening Gifted Education Act that requires us to focus on issues of equity in our gifted and uh, talented education programs as well. Uh, New Jersey Department of Education put out guidance recently on making sure, for example, that we're identifying English language learners who are gifted. So as part of implementing this new requirement, we have to make sure that we're keeping in mind the higher level rigorous uh, gifted courses that we wanna make sure are available for all of our students. And we do see significant underrepresentation now in those courses um, nationally and in New Jersey. We have other uh, civil rights laws and discrimination protections available under state and federal law, um, including under IDEA in section 504, title six of our Civil Rights Act. We had some good news uh, today coming out regarding title IX. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education is planning to issue new guidance on Title IX that makes clear that under federal law, transgender students are protected under Title IX. And this has been an issue of controversy at the federal level. Um, but even while there has been some controversy over this issue at the federal level, we have a very clear state law ensuring that our transgender students are fully protected. Uh, we have a number of other requirements that have been put into place and I'm listing them here because as we implement this new uh, curriculum requirement and we have what can be very sensitive conversations, potentially some of these other laws could um, come into play. So we do have the Crown Act that was enacted to make sure that we are not in any way discriminating against individuals because of factors that are inextricably linked to race, including hair texture, hairstyle. Uh, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act to make sure that individuals are not singled out because of a disability, including any mental health issues that the individual might have. We have to be aware of 
potential issues of entanglement between school and religion. As we're implementing this new curriculum requirement, uh, we are required to try to make sure that students are not targeting each other because of their religious beliefs. Of course, at the same time, we're talking about these issues. Uh, we should not be advocating in any way for any particular religion or for uh, religion generally um, and trying to advocate any particular position regarding that issue. So we have to avoid any potential establishment clause issue. As we think about these issues, again, we have an even broader context to think about. Uh, New Jersey has a set of requirements um, to put in place a comprehensive equity plan that really covers every aspect of school district operations. Uh, the current plan covers the period 2019-2022, uh, so districts should now be thinking about revising that plan for the next three-year period, and there will be a requirement to have the new plans in place uh, probably by June of next year. Um, the plan covers all aspects of your operations, including, of course, your educational program, but it goes well beyond that. It looks at hiring policies, patterns and programs, facilities, um, every aspect of your district's operations. It also makes sure that we are doing a deep dive when it comes to student performance data. And uh, many of you I know are very familiar with the challenges related to our current achievement gaps. Uh, they're not unique to New Jersey. These are national challenges. Uh, but it's critical that as we're implementing uh, this new requirement, we're sensitive to significant achievement gaps that do exist, that we're paying attention to that data, that we're looking at data regarding uh, disproportionate classification of students that is sometimes linked to race, uh, that we're looking at our staffing practices and assignments um, and making sure that we are equitable in our staffing, uh, that we're looking at our student discipline data we see huge disparities in discipline. Uh, and of course, that we're looking at participation in rigorous programs, and we're constantly getting feedback from all of our stakeholders, students, parents, and staff, when we're looking at issues of equity. When we get into the classroom in particular, as we're implementing this new requirement, um, we have to make sure that we are not seeing ineffective uh, implementation of this in particular classrooms or uh, willful disregard or uh, willful acts not to implement this curriculum in any particular classrooms. So we have to make sure that we have equal and bias-free ac access to this curriculum, um, that even if an individual teacher, and this certainly could happen, has some personal objection to any portion of this, uh, as a legal requirement, um, you're going to have to, in good faith, implement this entire uh, curriculum. And your personal views that potentially could come into conflict with this uh, certainly uh, should not get in the way of implementing this appropriately. Uh, so you want to think about inequities that can happen in classroom practices. Um, and we can't be afraid to look at the data when it comes to inequities. For example, when we look at data on student referrals related to discipline, you might find it's a very small number of teachers who have a very large number of disciplinary referrals. And sometimes we see patterns in those referrals that are linked to factors such as race or ethnicity. We wanna pay attention to that when we're looking at these issues. So there are many foreseeable legal issues that could arise. And part of my job as the director of Legal One is to try to think through those worst case scenarios um, and plan to make sure they don't happen, to proactively think through the steps we have to take to make sure that we have a positive experience when we're implementing such an important new requirement. So we should now be thinking about what if some of these issues arise? Um, students are going to be discussing uh, current events that may be very sensitive. Um, and we have to make sure that our teachers appropriately set the ground rules as we're implementing this new curriculum. That we understand the things that are uh, appropriate and not appropriate as we're discussing race or ethnicity or religion or gender identity or sexual orientation. Taking the time in advance to have clear, well thought out, understandable guidelines um, is critical because it is foreseeable that without that, 
um, while we're having these difficult conversations, things could be said in ways that are harmful. And once the harm occurs, we're doing a tremendous amount of work to try to remediate and deal with that harm. We should also be ready, as I mentioned earlier, for parental objections and attempts by some small number of parents to try to opt out or, or opt their child out of having to be exposed to this curriculum. That is not an option. And we wanna find ways to engage with parents and try to get them to understand that uh, this is not in any way trying to proselytize or trying to promote any sort of a political agenda. This is about promoting respect and support uh, for all of us and celebrating our diversity. We should be prepared for uh, some potential teacher or other staff member objections to implementing the curriculum. Um, and you might have a staff member, and we've seen this across the country, say that I have deeply held religious views and I just can't teach this. Um, we want to be sensitive to those issues, but let's be clear, there is no option to say that I am going to opt myself out of teaching this curriculum. And we want to make sure that we don't open that door um, and simply ask uh, another teacher to cover for a teacher who's refusing to implement a curriculum. That would be a very dangerous concept. Uh, we may have some well-intentioned teachers who don't completely think through their assignments. Um, as they're implementing these sensitive um, new discussion pieces in their classroom. So it's going to be critical for principals and supervisors and assistant principals to take the time to review lesson plans and think through, it, is this lesson plan something that can be effectively implemented? Is it age appropriate? Um, have we appropriately set the ground rules before actually moving forward with this lesson plan? So taking the time to review those lessons is critical. Um, we know that there could potentially be insensitive student comments linked to protected characteristics. Um, and again, there are many cases where those comments are not um, intentional. Um, nevertheless, we have to be prepared for those comments and be prepared to respond in the moment and longer term. We know that some students may share personal experiences as we're having these discussions. Um, you may have some students who share their personal experience where they experience some form of discrimination. And a teacher needs to know how to handle that issue. We shouldn't, of course, be asking our teachers to become counselors, but there are appropriate steps to be taking in that moment and then longer term steps to make sure that student is connected to the supports that they need. And there may also be longer term steps that involve addressing if there was a potential discrimination issue, um, investigating and addressing that underlying issue. I gave you an example before. Um, it's possible that objections can also come from our, the highest levels of the district, including board members um, who could actually try to uh, attempt to block implementation of the curriculum. And it's going to be important that you work as an administrative team um, to talk through these issues with your board and make sure they understand this new requirement. Uh, we need to be ready um, to um, respect and honor the First Amendment rights of students and staff and understand the limitations of those rights. Um, we are, as we implement this curriculum, going to have some difficult conversations and some of that will be within the bounds. And we need to recognize that. Um, so under the Tinker versus Des Moines standard laid out by the US Supreme Court, uh, if speech is not causing substantial disruption to the school environment, if it is not harassing to individual students, if it's not lewd or vulgar or promoting illegal activity or the violation of school rules, it's possible that uh, students are going to say some things that other students disagree with. And that's okay. Um, and understanding how to facilitate that sort of a conversation where we can have honest exchanges within appropriate uh, ground rules is really important. We need to also respect the First Amendment rights of staff members, but make sure that staff members understand the limitations on those rights as we're implementing this important curriculum requirement. So staff members certainly um, have First Amendment rights, uh, when they are on their own time outside of school, staff members have much broader First Amendment rights, but they're not unlimited. So it's possible that a staff member could say something on the weekend, on social media, on their own time, that school districts would still have to address 
Uh, so we want to think about this is a the three part test that we want to think about when it comes to staff speech. Are we talking about a matter of general public concern or is it a private grievance? You have greater rights when you're talking about matters of public concern. Are you speaking as a private citizen or trying to represent the school district? You have broader rights speaking as a private citizen. Are you making statements that are likely to disrupt close working relationships that we have to have with students, parents, and other staff members within the school district? So one example, um, and you know, uh, unfortunately we have some case law that we can learn from. One example was a case down in South Jersey. A security guard was upset that a police officer had been shot in Philadelphia. Certainly that's a matter of general public concern. The security guard on her own time outside of school made a comment and didn't say she was speaking on behalf of the school district. So she was still within her rights at that moment in wanting to make a comment. But the comment she made failed the third part of the test. It would undermine close working relationships. The comment was, I'm tired of these thugs and a racist term was attached to this as well, shooting our cops. And when that comment was made, it completely undermined the ability of that security guard to work in that school district going forward. And the district terminated that security guard. Um, so staff members have to understand the limitations of First Amendment rights that things you are saying, even on your own time outside of school could be so harmful that you can no longer be in that school district. And we've seen other comments like that too. There was a case involving a first grade teacher who went on social media and said, I feel like I'm a warden to future criminals. And that teacher was terminated, even though it was a tenured teacher, tenure charges were brought. Um, so we wanna make sure that staff members think before they post, um, that we think through the comments we're making and the potential harm that they could cause. We also have to be careful as we navigate issues of religion, and we're going to, as part of this curriculum requirement, be talking about accepting um, all students, regardless of their religious beliefs, um, and not discriminating in any way because of somebody's religion. So uh, we want to be careful as we do that. Um, I mentioned here a case from the Frenchtown School District. That was where the district um, decided to allow some religious songs, but not others, and started trying to discriminate in their uh, music program, which songs were acceptable and which ones were not. Now it seemed that the district was uh, choosing which religions it was favoring and which ones it was not. And we certainly cannot do that. We had a case where a coach in good faith was trying to take a knee and uh, support uh, the football team in the middle of a prayer. Um, but that certainly was viewed as the coach endorsing religion and actively participating in religious expression, which was not acceptable. We had a case where a teacher had a lesson that was actually in her lesson plans called the can of squirms, where every student was required to get up in front of the class and share embarrassing, demeaning, personal experiences that they had gone through. And in that case, the district tried to bring tenure charges, but the lesson had been reviewed by the school principal and had been approved. So the tenure charges were not successful in that case. So we have to take the time to carefully look at lesson plans as we're implementing this new requirement. We had a case involving a second grade student um, who allegedly bullied another second grade student whose gender identity um, had changed. And this was a difficult concept for second grade students. Uh, the commissioner of education did say in this case though, that even at the second grade level, if a student is counseled and is um, told about the harm that their comments are causing, and then continues to make those comments, that you could have a bullying case at the second grade level. Now it turns out that in this particular case, uh, the evidence did not support that it was bullying, uh, but it's important to recognize that as we're discussing issues of gender identity, we need to do it in a way that is age appropriate so that um, we can try to cut off these potential issues from arising. And one other example, we had a case involving um, a student of Asian descent um, who was targeted by other students in what certainly could have been a bullying incident. And we have seen a number of very disturbing uh, cases of this across the country. Um, in this particular case, the student was targeted 
uh, but it was a very resilient student and it was uh, deemed not to be a violation of the anti-bullying bill of rights because we didn't have the substantial disruption for that student. We did have a major issue in that case that still had to be addressed. So keep in mind, even where you don't have a bullying case, you can have inappropriate comments that must be addressed and that we must clearly indicate are not acceptable. And that could happen as we're implementing this new requirement. So at this point, I wanted to turn the conversation over to Dr. Enola Ajayi to talk about the really incredible work that one school district is doing um, in a very comprehensive way at looking at issues of equity. So Dr. Ajayi. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, David, for your introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with everyone what we have implemented so far in Bridgeton. The first thing we looked at is the difference between equality and equity. Next slide. We wanted to make sure that everyone in the district understand when it comes to equality and equity, what is the difference? Equality is the same thing, meaning giving same thing to everybody. But when it comes to equity, it, we have to recognize each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. So in other words, equity is about fairness and it ensures that each person gets what the person needs. Next slide, please. So the first step that we took in Bridgeton uh, towards diversity, equity, and inclusion was we formed the central office equity team. And these teams are comprised of four principals with uh, different cultural backgrounds, three central administrators with different cultural backgrounds. We also have parents among a, among a group with different cultural backgrounds. And we also have students with different cultural backgrounds at the central level. And then we proceeded to uh, create the school level based diversity, equity, and inclusion. And with, with the same components, we have five staff, uh, between five and six staff members with different cultural backgrounds. We also included parents and also students in grades eight through 12 when we were making the selection. What we've done so far, as you've heard from my colleagues, is when the uh, regulations was enacted on March the 1st of 2021. And then we decided that, you know what? It's time for us to do more than we've been doing. So we started in March, April, May, June, we've been having meetings just to discuss different uh, kinds of topics when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. As you can see, uh, Bridgeton has a, a comprehensive equity plan that we've been implementing for three years. Our last year will be 21-22 school year. Next slide, please. And the next step after that is what we've done with the diversity, equity, and inclusion team is to make sure that everybody understand the reason and the purpose of why this team was formed. So everybody knows that uh, when it comes to DEI, uh, everybody must be sure that equity aims to identify and destruct or eliminate any barrier that will prevent full participation of some groups. And also we make sure that the team, part of the reasons, uh, for the DEI is to ensure the inclusion of all students who learn in different and valued areas, uh, uh, their needs are met and trusted. And then the last but not the least is to create awareness against prejudice on race, creed, color, national origin, ancestry, status, uh, sexual orientation, gender, disability, or socioeconomic uh, status. Next slide, please. And then the next step that we took after that was we made sure that every month since March through June, we are meeting to discuss different aspects of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also identify 
some areas of inequities in our classrooms. And after we identified the areas of inequities, what we've done is we sat down and then decided to start taking the areas where we found the inequities and we started addressing them. Uh, we've been able to address some of the inequity, but we still have a long way to go. But everybody now is aware of the areas where we are found to have uh, difficulties. Part of what we also discuss is to celebrate multiculturalism. So every year, starting from next year, we're going to have Multicultural Celebration Month, where we celebrate everybody's culture and we speak different languages. Everybody in the district would know. I remember when I was in Trenton, they usually put it on the board that in, in Trenton, there are 47 languages spoken in Trenton. And we try to establish the same thing in Bridgeton to make sure that everybody knows what different languages other people are speaks. For myself, I speak three languages and everybody in Bridgeton knows Dr. Jai speaks three languages. So uh, we just want to make sure that everybody is aware of the different cultural background, different kind of clothing that we wear from different countries. Also food, we have different kinds of foods in, from different culture. So if you know everybody's culture, then that will help everybody to understand where everybody is coming from. Then part, uh, part of this plan also, we make sure that we identify the areas of biases systemic racism, I already mentioned the part with the inequities, and being transparent when we have problems. Because if there's no transparency, then we're going to continue to have problems. And somebody like me, I don't mind to explain to you if there are issues and we address it amicably and in a, civil, in a civilized manner. In addition to what I just said, we also have a rubric. We have a rubric that has five components. And we, we are using that rubric as a progress monitoring to help us monitor how we are implementing uh, this, uh, um, uh, in, I mean, inclusion, diversity, and equity in the district. So in Bridgeton, we've declared the Multicultural Month to be June, and we're going to start that next school year. So as I was saying to you, a lot of people, they get very uncomfortable when you are talking about race or racism. But I think it's time for us to have that uncomfortable conversation so that we can address all the uh, areas where we are having difficulties. One of the things we also did was to come up with, uh, we came up with an intentional, intentional professional development for all staff. And that is what we've been doing since April. Actually, before I came here today, we had the DEI training with, uh, a company from Trenton that they've been teaching, I mean, training all staff on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. So when we form our central team, we establish the short-term goals and also we have the long-term goals. So our long-term goals, as you can see on the slide, is for three years. And we've started uh, implementing the equity plan and one of the main reasons is to close the achievement gap of all students, especially special education students, ELL students, gifted and talented students, and at-risk students. Uh, I already mentioned that once we identify the areas of inequities, we've been finding solutions to how to uh, um, solve the areas of the inequities. And the rubric I just mentioned, there are five components. And those five components are data-based decision-making, cultural responsiveness, core instructional program, and also it covers the assessment, which means the universal screening and progress monitoring, and also interventions and supports. Next slide, please. Uh, we've also been talking to our curriculum department so that what we are discussing about DEI we, uh, the curriculum departments, we've been collaborating so that most of these topics can now be embedded into our curriculum. Now that the regulations have passed March, uh, March 1, 2021 of this year, and in that regulation, like David said earlier, one of my colleagues said earlier, uh, the regulation tells us 
to incorporate this in the physical and health education classes. But what Bridgeton has done is we are going to incorporate the DEI into our physical and health education classes or curriculum and also in the social studies classes as well. Uh, all the teachers that we put on the DEI team, they were intentionally selected. We didn't want the teachers that will come to the meeting and be quiet. We want the teachers that will speak up and tell us their mind so that we can address those concerns. Uh, as you can also see, we've been disaggregating data in reading, math, and discipline so that that will help us to know what areas to focus on. And when we disaggregate the data, we focus on uh, race, gender, and uh, ethnicity, and disabilities, and so on and so forth. And once we developed this program, what we also, I mean, the plan, what we also did was we make sure that we are evaluating the strategies and the plans that we are implementing, because we want to make sure that the plans that we are implementing, they are working correctly. And if they are not working correctly, that is why we try to evaluate to make sure we need to tweak or make some changes to the plan that we have. Uh, part of what uh, we also discussed uh, is to empower our students and staff by providing training to address the areas of perceived inequities that is arising from prejudice, regardless of race, creed, color, uh, marital status, sexual orientation, gender, religion, disability, housing status, and socioeconomic status. I mentioned it earlier that we have the consultants from Trenton and, Prince, and Princeton that comes in every month to train our staff. And in, in Bridgeton also, we met with the county and Cumberland County, they are planning in, uh, to form DEI consortium starting from September. So we are really excited about that. And our goal also is to partner with the other school districts who are implementing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as you can see from the slide, uh, we've been incorporating DEI into our curriculum. And as you can see, there's a PowerPoint on the state website. If you look at that PowerPoint on pages 434, 43, and 45, they specifically emphasize the areas of these uh, student learning standards that focuses on uh, race, class, and gender. And this summer in July, we also have about four teachers that will be writing curriculum on race, class, and gender. So as you can see right there, all the topics are right there and the resources are available. After this presentation, I'm sure that the FEA will make the resources available to you. Next slide, please. Uh, well, this concludes my presentation. As I said earlier, we are looking forward to the other, uh, other department, I mean, other districts to partner with us so we can see what they are doing and we can share what we are doing in our district. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aniola. It's a really uh, very impressive to look at the great work that you're doing in, on every aspect of your district's operations. And it's wonderful to see the partnerships and the uh, work that you're doing uh, with other districts and across the state. So with that, let me turn this over to Donna McInerney uh, so that we can uh, begin the next portion of the webinar. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, thanks, David, and thanks, Aniola, for sharing the path that you've been taking. FEA has been working with um, a lot of districts, providing training and coaching with the, their equity councils and leadership teams. Um, I think it's great that we were beginning to see schools and districts coming together. We're even launching a new Equity in Action Academy later this summer for school and district teams that are centered around problems of practice. Um, and so I think the power of collaboration is always one of our greatest resources. And Yola, in the um, chat while you were speaking, a couple, uh, one, of the, one of our viewers asked if you might share the rubric so if, that you referenced. So if you're willing to do that, uh, you can either post it in the chat or send it to Melissa who will make sure it goes out tomorrow with the other resources. 
So right now, let's continue this conversation with our panel from four districts, um, focusing not just on implementation, but some of the communication plans that have been put in place, how uh, these districts are proactively anticipating and addressing potential challenges. As I mentioned at the start of the program, many of them have been doing this work for a few years now. So we um, are interested in also having them share out how they have addressed challenges that have already been met. My colleague, Fidelia Sturdivant, a longtime New Jersey educator and leader, will co-facilitate this panel with me. And while we've got um, questions that we've uh, put together, we're also looking for this to be a conversation. So feel free to post in the chat and I'll ask my PSA and FEA colleagues to keep an eye on that. So the first question we have, which I'm gonna ask um, all four of the districts to respond to, and, and I'll, I'll invite each one of you to do that, is in looking at the legislation and its integration with the New Jersey Student Learning Standards, how is your school district preparing for this? Um, what have you been doing? So how is it being integrated into curriculum instruction across the grade levels and across the content areas? So I'm gonna ask uh, Logan Township, Heather Moran to be our opening responder. Thanks, Donna. It is a, a topic near and dear to our heart here in Logan Township. Um, it has been a journey that we've been on well before the March 1st um, law passage, and we feel that that is just uh, solidifying the importance of our work. In terms of how we're getting ready for this and how we've been getting ready for this, I, I thought of three things um, that I think are huge to our success here. The first is that we have a dedicated committee um, it, it's acronym, because every good committee in education has an acronym, is ICMP, um, and it stands for Inclusive Curriculum Through Multiple Perspectives. Um, and it is a group of educators across our pre-K to eight setting um, that meet monthly to look at all areas of our curriculum and make sure that we are looking at those uh, New Jersey state standards in uh, ways that are culturally responsive and that include the voices of everyone. Um, that group uh, has a, um, a, an email address that individual teachers uh, who are having problems in their classroom or having uh, discussions or issues that they want suggestions on can submit lessons and ideas to. And that committee will look at those things and say, okay, you're missing this view or we see it this way. Um, and it's also going back through and address some of the things that were historically done here year after year. So a lot of our celebrations and a lot of our traditions, so to speak, uh, have been looked at by that committee and either found to uh, pass the litmus test of being uh, having multiple perspectives included or have been taken away. And that has caused a lot of angst in a lot of grade levels, but it really has uh, created an environment which includes the perspectives of everyone. The second thing is that we have started to look at our discipline and the way that we handle student conduct um, and have been working very hard on a culturally responsive, positive uh, behavior support system in schools. Um, that has been our, uh, our most recent challenge um, and making sure that the values that we are promoting with students are inclusive of everyone's voice and uh, all stakeholder groups, parents, students, and staff. Um, and then again, that everybody's perspective is, is indicated in those. And the third thing that we have implemented all the way down to fourth grade um, this year is a student voice group. So providing students with opportunities to comment and have a real voice that impacts decisions that are being made uh, at every level of the school district. So I think those three things um, really are the core of how we're going to address chapter uh, 32. Thank you, Heather. Um, it's interesting, we're seeing that pop up in a couple of places, the idea of integrating student voice into some of this work. We're now going to travel from Heather way down in South Jersey, travel north and ask um, Shay Richardson from East Orange to respond to the question about what is implementation looking like? How is your district preparing for this? 
Greetings, everyone, and happy Wednesday. Um, in East Orange, it gives me great pleasure. Like Heather, uh, we've been doing this work, and we see, you know, the importance of allowing our scholars to be seen, to be heard, and to be empowered. And so, um, to tackle that, we've been doing a lot of multicultural. Uh, educational programming. We're doing curriculum revisions. I assumed this role in January of 2020. And so uh, under the phenomenal leadership of my boss, Ms. Anita Champagne and Mr. Abdul Salim Hassan, we've been doing curriculum revisions and we're starting young. You know, we have those naysayers that think that our young scholars, they're too young to learn about some of these topics. And we don't believe that they're hearing it in the news, they're hearing it or seeing it on social media. And so as long as it's age appropriate, like Dave said, uh, our goal is to ensure that all scholars are heard and that they're empowered and celebrated. And so we had curriculum revisions such as for our elementary grade level, because I'm a supervisor of social studies, we have ELA and humanities or ELA and social studies has become a humanities course. And so last summer that was for grades three to five, working with my wonderful colleague, Miss Bridget Green, who is the ELA elementary supervisor and our wonderful curriculum writers, we were able to do that. But we did that without having to use a textbook. And I have to say that we're very, happy about that because our textbooks oftentimes are very guilty of ostracizing or omitting historical truths and in which our scholars don't see themselves, right? And we need them to see themselves so that they feel embraced and accepted and acknowledged. So uh, we did that. And so the topics, and it was very difficult to say the least because it's a paradigm shift, right? So it's not only that we had the pandemic happening, but that's what I need. I need my book. You know, I, that's my go-to, but we did it so that it's, um, I want to say it's like loaded with a number of great resources that are free, right. That are at our uh, disposal, but we didn't look for them because we were using that book. Right. And so we have that for grades three to five, but now we're actually concluding the process for grades K to two. And it gives me great joy to know that for a September 15th to October 15th, which we know is Hispanic Heritage Month, that within the curriculum, there are resources that a teacher can be able to turn to so that the scholars, whether they're Hispanic or not, they're able to learn about you know, this wonderful Heritage Month, the same for Native American Heritage Month in November. And so in speaking of Heritage Months, that's another thing that we did where we have the resources, we also have guest speakers. And so a lot of our programming was able to speak to celebrating these various cultures, whether it's the mandate for the Holocaust mandate. I'm proud to say we had a survivor of Auschwitz come and a Holocaust survivor come and as a guest speaker, right? And the scholars were in the chat and they were able to ask questions and they had so much empathy and care because of what the survivors um, encountered and what they you know, experienced. So these are the things that we're starting to do. We're continuing to build on that. Intentional professional development is key. And so the most recent PD that we had was provided, and I can put in the, in the chat for our viewers, the Institute for Anti-Racist Education. Ms. Ashley Lipscomb is the founder of this wonderful organization. And let me tell you guys, she did a PD last month entitled, we are open to the uncomfortable, talking about race, class, and culture with colleagues and students. Colleagues, phenomenal. Everyone, she has a guide, she, they get a guidebook. She helps them with navigating how to have these conversations with colleagues and scholars and everyone left feeling empowered. So we have intentional PD, we have our curriculum revisions that we're doing. And we're also going to have some committees like we have Dr. Ajay who, who has these wonderful, in Bridgeton, these wonderful uh, committees. This is something we're moving towards where we're gonna have our young scholars, but also our parents and educators. So we have our lead teachers who are doing great things. So we're working together. It's all stakeholders on deck in order to make this a success. Thank you, Shay. I see a lot of integration from a bunch of different groups and also a big focus on rigorous and rich culturally responsive materials for teachers to access. Great, thank you. We're gonna come down to the center of the state to South Brunswick and ask Jen Disler to reply. 
Hi, everybody. Um, I'm the Assistant Superintendent in South Brunswick. I love hearing my colleagues talk about what's happening there um, in your places and lots of similar things here. Um, I, I, I start back with what you said, Jenny, when you were talking about the legislation and how the intent, you know, it's about being more compassionate and showing more kindness. And, um, you know, I think of it as being better humans, right? And so as we as we do this work, that's always been the forefront. And for us in South Brunswick, it's a real um, uh, light uh, about three years ago was when we um, worked on our strategic plan. And I'm so, in, in Eniola, just to hear how well you use your equity plan, that's always been like a a transgental thing like it's like out there where our strategic plan is kind of our guiding light which which works equity so it's really neat to hear how your district uses the equity plan the way you do um, for for us it's it's the strategic plan and a core value that's threaded throughout no matter what we're focusing on equity in in that same description and definition as you described Eniola is our mission and our vision and um, with that has to do with the access and preparation for kids um, being able to uh, take away and remove some of those accelerated classes and how can we meet the needs of kids, um, prepare kids, look at prerequisites, all of those pieces were some of the work and now as this chapter 32 has come out, we've celebrated it because it's really, um, you know, uh, I think I think you said it, um, uh, who spoke first. Um, was it you, Heather? I think you said it. It just kind of like validated all the work that's happening, right? Um, I, I add to this conversation, I agree with you, what you all said, but I think one big part for us in preparing for this was the communication side of things and the transparency side of things. So I'll add that as a part of South Brunswick. And we've really looked to um, those that do it well. Um, our social studies teachers for years and years have been those ones in, in um, the trenches having those conversations with kids. We look to them as leaders. They've helped our colleagues and our staff as part of it. We've looked to communicate and work with other um, counties and other districts. So I really try to keep the network open from a curriculum side of things. Um, seeing the long laundry list of the curriculum mandates, David, I don't know if it's overwhelming or helpful to see all that. But <laughs> we're doing that every day. And so I'm really counting on your colleagues and seeing what other folks are doing. That's something that we do in South Brunswick, um, as well as honing in on the social studies curriculum, really trying to implement and incorporate the many perspectives, use good resources, but not rely on, on some of the resources that are there. They're you know trying to go about it the right way, keep politics out of it. Um, I know one of the later questions, we've had a couple challenges and some pushback. Um, so I, I'll, I'll be happy to, to share those. Um, but really having our supervisors look at every single content area, every curriculum, and really try to um, focus on this inclusion and the diversity. Um, our counseling curriculum, all of those pieces have been ways that we've injected it. And, um, you know, we're learning and we're growing and, and getting better at it. But I think the PD that, that some of you spoke to is, is a really cornerstone for us as well. Um, but I think the transparency and the communication, our district board meetings, um, parent academies, um, as well as stakeholder groups has really been a, a successful way for us to communicate, see action happen, and um, help people to understand and, and know what we're talking about with all these different mandates. Some of them seem scary, but once we talk about it, some, some families get a little bit okay with it. So thank, thank you, Jen. You made some great points about communication and transparency, but I think learning is a critical piece because um, when parents and stakeholders and community members learn what really is at the heart of this, I think that's a critical first step. Um, Eniola from Bridgeton, you've talked a, a lot about and gave us great information about your connection between the diversity and equity work and, and your comprehensive equity plan. Is there anything that you'd like to add about the, the implementation piece of the curriculum and instruction requirement? Uh, yes. Um, currently, we are planning to do uh, what we call town hall meetings, where we are going to invite our parents just to listen to them about their thoughts or if they have any ideas. And the curriculum department will join us too, so they can hear it because what we are going to be doing when it comes to teaching our students, we have to go through the curriculum and instruction. So we are preparing to do 
a town hall to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thanks, Emiola. Again, nice integration across the different pieces. Adelia, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Donna. Keywords, pushback across all grade levels takes me into our next discussion. Based on your experience, why is it important for this work to take place across all grade levels? And Heather, if you don't mind, I would like to start with you again. Well, thanks, Fidelia. Um, I, I think that the, the, the heart of that really combines pushback uh, into that uh, sentence. I think that if you wait uh, to bring up these issues with middle schoolers, in my case, middle schoolers, and I'm assuming high schoolers, um, students have already uh, developed their own opinions about things based on a on hundred other things, um, whether it's their parents, whether it's the textbook they're using, whether it's the materials that they've been exposed to, and trying to undo that um, I think is much more challenging because then it becomes a debate about right and wrong. And when you really start at the core of these issues, I don't think they're, um, that it should be about right and wrong. It should be about truth and facts. And, and if you start those things early on and, and make them age appropriate, then as you add pieces in that become maybe a little more controversial, that maybe become a little more challenging to understand, the students have that foundational understanding of what it means to be a good human. Um, and I think those are the issues that are at the basis of all of this work. And if you come at it from that point of view, as early as kindergarten, when you're teaching what it means to be a family, um, as soon as you teach that a family has a mom and a dad and some kids in it, then you have to undo that later on. When you talk about a family in terms of what it means from an emotional point of view or what it means from a caring point of view, then that becomes much more inclusive. It can look different ways for different folks and you're not undoing that later on. Um, same thing I think is huge whether you're talking about race, sexual identity, Identity or any of those things. You're never undoing learning. Um, because if we're all honest, what our kindergarten and first grade teachers told us becomes gospel. Um, and, and that's when we get those foundational skills. I remember being a teacher and my own ch child saying to me, that's not how Miss So-and-so said to do it. Um, so we have that, that power um, and we need to use it uh, in a way that is making better humans as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much, Heather. Would you like to add to that, Shay? I would love to. I have this belief that there a scholar, and I call just so that we know, I call students scholars and I have been since I started in education in 2005 as a form of empowerment. So that's one of my culturally responsive ways of empowering the youth in East Orange. So even when they may not be as scholarly, right? As far as not uh, acing a test or what have you, but I, I believe that each of them is a scholar at heart because we're supposed to believe that they're all destined for greatness. So I use that word in place of student, okay? Our scholars, as Heather has stated, I mean, as young as kindergarten, and even I think it's as young as three, actually it's younger than that. I believe it's as young as three months. A baby knows the difference in our complexion because they're able to detect that, right? Now they won't know black, white, okay, but they're going to know that there's differences in my caregivers versus strangers or people outside of my home. So then we know that it, you know race is a social construct. We know that racism is learned behavior, right? No one is just born this way, we, we learn this. And so as Heather stated, we want them to be good people. We want them to be good human beings. We want them to be agents of change. And in order to foster that, we can't start late. We have to start young. They have to understand these, these now, I, they have to understand these um, ways of life at that time. However, we have to make sure that it's age appropriate. And I believe that Dave mentioned that in the opening, right? So the, the lessons have to be vetted uh, to ensure that materials are age appropriate. But I'll give an example. 
uh, the one year anniversary of George Floyd just passed. I shared some materials uh, as far as wanting the teachers to reflect with the young scholars. As a five-year-old, and I'm Tabitha, I could be home and it doesn't matter my background. If my grandpa or pop pop or abuelo or whomever is talking about these atrocities and these current events, and then there's the disconnect of when I go to school, my teacher's not mentioning it. What does that say to me, right? What does that mean? As Heather said, I mean, if I'm not hearing it there, then there's that disconnect. And so then maybe in my mind, little Tabitha's mind, it's not important. Well, why does it matter? So it, we don't need that disconnect any longer, right? We need our scholars to be able to lift their voices and be able to express themselves and they need the ability to do that. And so I am a firm believer in starting them young, of course, with age appropriate lessons, they need to start as young as possible so that they're aware, so that they have a voice. And a lot of the times we can learn from them. It's so amazing what they know, right? At five years old, we may think, oh, you know, little Tabitha, what do you know? But we should never have that mindset because they are amazing. And we just have to not project our implicit biases onto them. That's where it starts. So all of this starts with us, but I do believe that this work is very important across all grade levels. And I'll just end with this. I was, I was a history teacher for, what was it, 13 years, right? On the high school level. When you don't do this work, and I have to speak from a social studies perspective, when they don't have the foundation, and I know my colleagues here will agree, once you inherit them on that higher level, right? Where they're only years, away from going out into the real world, to college and beyond, it's such a disservice to them. There's so much that they're unaware of. They're, and, and then we have to work, and I think Heather alluded to this, we have to make the bridge the gaps. We have to make the connections for them or assist them. And you're doing away with how many years of them missing out on the importance of certain cultural events or past atrocities and how that connects to the present. That has to be done. And if it starts young, if we start them young, then I think that they'll have a better awareness, they'll be more empathetic, and they'll be more productive and well-cultured. Thank you, Shay. Jennifer, when um, Shay mentioned we learn from the young ones, you smiled. What is your take on this? Sure, so I, I love, like again, I, I love listening to you all and I, I agree that it should be developmentally appropriate, right? So even the littlest guys can be parts of the conversation um, and, and we can build on prior learning and get deeper into the concept. But I, I think simply, you know, no matter the age of our students, um, they have the right and should be represented. They should be comfortable and they should really be able to see themselves in the curriculum. And I, and I think that's why it, this, is, this is so important at all levels, at all ages. Uh, Jennifer, you jumped right into that diversity when you talked about materials, and I'm so glad you did. But you know, um, Aniala, you, start, you were nodding your head as you heard uh, the other panelists talk. So why don't you give us your take on all levels? So if the teachers are giving us a, a pushback, or so maybe the parents are giving us pushbacks on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I believe, and I strongly believe that appropriate training, intentional training for teachers and parents will really help us to educate the parents and the teachers. So by the time we train them over and over and over again, they will turn around and believe what we are trying to explain and to, to, do, to do with the, uh, with, the, with the parents and the teachers. And I also agree with my colleagues who have spoken earlier to start right from the beginning, meaning from kindergarten, because that is the foundation. If we have a strong foundation, you will know that the house will remain forever if there's no <laughs> hurricane or something crazy to just destroy the house. So I do agree with my colleagues. And it's also important for us to empower our teachers and make sure that we provide appropriate resources for them so that they can be comfortable to teach 
and have this uncomfortable conversation. Thank you so very much. Donna, would you like to take the next question? Thanks, Bedelia. Um, I, I really am hearing a, a, a recurring thread throughout all of this about how important learning is for the students, for the educators, for the parents and the community members and the families. So I'm actually, I'm gonna take us out of order on the questions because I wanna make sure we get to this one. I'm gonna ask all the districts to respond to this, but how has your district communicated with families and community members? How have you handled challenges? How do you foresee um, emerging challenges and, and how you might proactively address these? Um, so I will start off, I'm gonna ask all four of the districts to reply. I'll start off with Logan, with Heather Moran. Thanks, Donna. Um, we definitely uh, were not the best at uh, letting our families know in the beginning. That has been a journey for us. Um, but we have started a newsletter that we put out um, once a month indicating all of the things that we're doing. Um, and that has, has been helpful in that it has uh, brought an awareness to the community. Um, I will say that the pandemic has certainly uh, accelerated, for lack of a better word, that process um, because literally parents were in uh, the classroom with students. Um, and I think over uh, the course of the past year, I have had more uh, discussions with parents about things that kids are reading, uh, discussions that students are having, uh, all of those kinds of things because parents were listening um, and involved in that. And while it was a lot on my shoulders, um, I think it has opened up the conversation and made it uh, so that more people in our district are willing to have those difficult conversations. And I do think that one of the things that you need to do is make sure that your staff is ready to have those and understand the why behind the work. Why are we doing these things? Why are we pressing uh, uh, buttons that we know are going to create some challenges with people? Um, so when you help your staff be able to have those conversations, um, they're more willing to interact with their parents as well. So through newsletters, through discussions, through sharing the text that we use, um, we try to send those home as well so that um, folks are ready to do that. And through sharing um, some of the assemblies and uh, cultural responsive PBIS things that we're doing, the fact that we've changed those rewards, the wording that we use in surveys, uh, and those kinds of things reaching out to parents, all of those things together have helped get the word out. Um, but again, I think the key is allowing all of the people in your organization to be able to have those conversations. Because if it's just coming from me, uh, it's, it's not serving anyone well. Thanks, Heather. Um, Shay, up in East Orange, if you could respond to any potential challenges. And we also have a question in the chat that any of our panelists can reply to, which is how have you handled pushback from student staff and parents who argue that teaching systemic racism is a form of indoctrination? So I'm gonna give you, ask you the general question and the specific one in the chat. Thank you, Donna. Um, when I think about communicating with families this has been the first year because as I said to everyone, I assumed this role in January of 2020 and it's been a joy this year to have the virtual parent meetings. So we've had virtual parent meetings. I've been having them at least once a month and it will either deal with some of the upcoming uh, programming that we're going to have or initiatives. So that has been very helpful. Parent surveys has been another way that we've communicated with families and community members. We're pretty active with social media. So of course, that is another way because sometimes that's a parent's go-to, right? You know, with mm -hmm. work and all of the demands of life, um, it's nice to be able to go to social media and be, remain abreast of events and uh, programs. Um, another thing that we've done is through letters. So when we think about the LGBTQ mandate uh, that was to be implemented this year, we have a guide that was uh, created last summer. And so I created a letter, you know, that was on our district website and that was also sent to parents because that was not just to inform the parents, of course, but to support my teachers in case I, I always say 
send them to me. You know, you can send the parents to me because as, as the supervisor, that's my job. I want to be able to empower you. I want you to know that you're not in a league of your own. We're here, right? We are the village. And so I don't mind engaging our parents to empower them because a lot of the times it's not ignorance is bliss and it's just being unaware. I don't, you know, what is this? And so in explaining and having that meeting of the minds, what I call it, it really helps them. Um, to answer the second part of the question, Donna, from the chat, I have had a situation, um, this wasn't with uh, teachers. Well, we have some teachers, right? Again, I mentioned, I think earlier, the paradigm shift is going to take some time for people to get acclimated. We're aware of that. As Queen Iniola said, as far as the PD, we definitely need to start with intentional PD because we can't assume that our teachers just know how to do this work. We must empower them to be able to do it. And so we have to seek the proper uh, facilitators to be able to empower our teachers. And we've done that. The situation involved Black Lives Matter at School Week is a national um, initiative. It started se several years ago. Actually, I believe it was in 2012 in the wake of the murder of Trayvon Martin. And Black, Black Lives Matter at school week is the first week of February, which we know is also Black History Month. In our elementary school, there was a lesson and uh, the teacher was having the young scholars create Black Lives Matter. It was just a sign, but they had to color it, you know, something Innocent, there was a video that we know uh, Sesame Street, right? So we think of age appropriate materials. Sesame Street had a video, this was shown, the scholars had that background knowledge and then they had the activity. Of course, because we are virtual, as Heather mentioned, our parents were attending you know, school with their scholars. The parent interrupted the actual lesson. And so they unmuted themselves. There were things said that they wanted their child removed. I in turn met with that parent and the principal, right? Because they didn't understand. They wanted to ensure that Black Lives Matter, as far as it being an actual protest, as far as this being a movement versus some of the other things that have transpired that are connected to that, that they won't be, weren't being misconstrued, that that wasn't of any propaganda that was being taught to his daughter. And after having that meeting of the minds, there was clarity, there was an understanding, and there was an appreciation that that wasn't the angle. We politely asked him you know, to not, of course, interrupt <laughs> the class, right? Because he was upset and he didn't understand. And so giving him the opportunity to speak and listening to me as the administrator over social studies, he understood what the actual purpose was. And so that was something, cause that's what he thought. He think he thought, you know, are you trying to indoctrinate my kid? And I had to explain that to him. It's not about that. It's about the awareness. It's about that this is a week of action and it's about us being able to have the scholars be aware, right? So um, that did happen. And then we also have staff that, you know, again, they're accustomed to a textbook. They're accustomed to maybe going to the book and teaching from that text. And that's not how we're doing it any longer. We are do going doing a deeper dive into some of the more controversial events. Like when you think of um, the anti-Asian hate that has been happening, um, it's unfortunate. Vincent Chen is uh, a name that is not synonymous with uh, the 80s or the Reagan pre Reagan's presidency, but it's something that's going to be in our modern U.S. history too, course, because Vincent Chen was murdered in, it was a hate crime in 1982, but how many people are aware of that, right? Um, and so this is, these are the things that we're trying to do a deeper dive into, but we know that everyone's not gonna be on board. And so my job is to make it so that we can be cohesive and so that everyone's empowered to do this work because at the end of the day, it's not about what we personally feel, it's about the scholars and them being in the best position to be successful. Thank you, Shay. I am gonna ask Eniola and Jennifer because I wanna get people up, folks out of here on time. Um, Eniola and Jennifer, any specific guidance or recommendations you would make about how to deal with the resistance piece? 
I, I would just say, I think listening is key. I think that if you can bring a family in um, and listen, you're gonna you're gonna kind of get through the noise and and better understand where they're coming from. I think the game of telephone happens a lot. So I think simply just really be open to listening so then you can help guide and educate. Thanks, Jen. And Yola? Yes, I will agree with Jennifer uh, regarding a conversation with the parents. We have to listen to them and we also have to communicate to our parents because once we continue to communicate with our parents, then they will begin to understand. Well, when I say communication, it doesn't mean one-time communication. It may take us one year, it may take us two years. It doesn't matter how long it takes. We just have to be consistent and continue to communicate with our parents and also educate them about what we are trying to do when it comes to diversity and inclusion. I mentioned earlier that we are in the process of doing a town hall meeting and that is where we invite all of our parents and the other people in the community so they can hear about these new regulations uh, of chapter 32 and what we are required to, to do or to present to our, to our students. So again, communication is the key to, to getting the diversity and inclusion into the right place where we want it to be. Thank you. Thank you, Aniola. Thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their experiences uh, their knowledge, their wisdom. I, uh, Chris Tavani, it's nice to see a sense of humor going on in the chat with your colleague. Um, I'm gonna ask Peg McDonald uh, if she could just jump in real quickly. She, she put together a, a fabulous resource folder with a lot of links, but Peg, if you could just talk for a couple minutes about these possible next steps, um, that would be great. Do I have you with me still? Yes, I'm still here. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everyone. What a great uh, presentation today. So the, the, this, sli this slide here talks about some possible next steps that are specific to the curricular changes uh, that you may want to make. And our message, and I think you could hear it loud and clear from the districts that we heard from, is to really look at the committees that you already have in place. Uh, the equity committee, as well as um, the uh, PLCs or curriculum committees that you have in place may be the place to start to begin to look at the curricula, but you need to ensure that those uh, committees are well representative of um, the, uh, the teachers that you have, the uh, racial ethnic uh, makeup of your district, etc. Um, if there are, uh, you know, make sure that you have teachers of English learners, students, stu uh, teachers of students with disabilities, and uh, teachers of gifted students on those committees so that whatever curricular ch changes you are making really address the needs of all students. Um, at times to address some of the things that David was saying, you might want to have the guidance counselor, the bullying specialist, or the school psychologist to help review and look at some of those curricular changes. Looking at curriculum as learning objectives, materials, methods, and assessments, identify what you have already in place to, that addresses these requirements, as well as the gaps, and then identify some action steps, possibly within some of the plans that you have already that can address those. So uh, David, if you wanna take us to the next slide and just uh, if we can click on that link. This is a page of resources that was developed based on the three areas in the law. Two of the instructional practices pieces were combined so that it starts with, David, can you click on that a little bit? There we go. So you'll see the first set of resources focuses on the instructional practices uh, requirements, those two sections in the law. And there are places like the Metro Center in New York, which has a self-evaluation tool around cultural responsiveness, and they have done extensive research in this area. So there are myriad resources right there. Um, as well, um, followed by that is the, um, there are uh, some uh, resources on safe, welcoming learning environments. And we have right in New Jersey, lots of resources, SEL competencies. You've been working on embedding them. How can they help with meeting these requirements as well as the school climate survey might be helpful in identifying both that student voice and the uh, staff voice and family voice around what needs to be done to help with the environment. 
There are also some general resources, including the department's list and the uh, link to the equity planning requirements so that as you're getting ready for your next plan, you'll have some resources there and you can start to think about how that equity plan can uh, address these things in the future. Donna? Thank you, Peg. And the link to the, the folder that Peg created is in the chat right now. You should be able to click it, go right to that resource folder. In that is the PowerPoint. And I encourage you to look at all the offerings of FEA, including Legal One around professional learning in district, um, asynchronous online courses, our equity uh, in action uh, leadership academy. So if, you, if you've got a, a few minutes, I really encourage you to look at all of the professional learning offerings that are available. Um, we work with teams from across the state all the time. Um, providing guidance and, and talking about their goals. To close us out, I, I just asked Jenny Lamont, we're going to come back to you, Jenny, to you, you opened us up talking a little bit about the legislation um, to ask you to close us out. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, panelists. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us today and giving us your valuable time. We think this really is an opportunity to transform our state's education system so that it is truly serving all of our students. While COVID-19 certainly highlighted many inequities in our schools and communities, we know that these inequities existed well before the pandemic. We have a chance now to reimagine and refocus our schools to ensure that all students are having their needs met. This new law can be part of a bold action that we can take together to ensure our schools are defined not by disparities, but by equity and inclusion of everyone. It certainly will begin these important conversations in our classrooms. And thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us today.